Yeah, I modified a, like I I won't go into so many details of some projects because um you know if we put this uh, on on YouTube and it's live, but I can still give some some interesting um, uh, insights into what we're doing. Okay, great. Okay, so I'll give a really quick introduction. Um, so. Hi everyone. We are. Uh, it's really nice to have our latest guest talk. Uh, ben Hoyle is uh, the a senior data scientist and a algorithms engineer at Carl Zeiss Vision. So I think that I actually am wearing Carl Zeiss lenses. Wow. And I can I can see quite well. And so thank you, Ben, for that. Good. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm sure you were directly involved in the exactly design. first hand. I was the one polishing the lenses. Yeah. Um, so Carl's background is, oh, sorry, Ben, not Carl. Ben Carl's Zeiss is the company, fine. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah. Um, Ben's background is in physics, cosmology. Um, he's worked at, uh, he comes from the UK. And after a stint, in, I'm just going through his LinkedIn just for an introduction. After a stint at the University of Barcelona, he co-founded a company where we have a number of al our alumni working at Ludio, uh, based in the UK at the time. And after that, alongside a postdoc in Munich, he then joined Carl Zeiss Vision. So we're looking forward to hearing a lot more about um, the work that you're doing there and perhaps some of your perspectives on data science um, and how it's used in industry. I, I'm sure I missed something. So Yavabel, I don't know if you want to add some color to my very dry introduction. Um, I mean, I, I think um, Ben can actually also add because it's yes a very big experience in both academic world where we I think we made the first time actually in 2007 when I was a master's student uh, so that's you know so uh, we know each other from a very long time and in cosmology we are I think working also we, we used to work in, in similar context uh, and sometimes so it's really you know number of experience from satellite image to you know, designing uh, some new experiments to actually then founding a video and kind of you know, in the business context and now going to the industry uh, with a number of, uh, you know, adding much more on the kind of the new era, um, deep learning and, and all that. So just please ask uh, whatever questions you have in terms of also his experience as well um, so, so that he can learn more. But I think Ben will tell us um, he's views as well as also I think you may you may touch about vision bandits how they are used as well uh, in the industry but again maybe not so I think we have been talking about what is where to focus and the best we say it is that you know frame it in such a way that it will help people to see uh, the paths the carry paths that one like as a junior uh, machine learning engineer data uh, data engineering here you know they probably most people here don't know uh, what it looks like, so then probably will touch in a number of uh, areas to um, tell us his opinion as well as also his observations. So Ben, sure, thanks a lot, Yabi. Um, uh, um, so yeah, I mean, I'm, I first met Yabi, like you said, back in two thousand seven, and this was in in South Africa on a on a on a in a national park on a boat, and so basically we had a cosmology conference called Jedi. Um, uh, which stand for like joint dark energy something I can't remember exactly, but basically um, we were we were in this houseboat cooped up with like fifteen other cosmologists, um, and we were trying to figure out good problems to work on and how to solve problems. And so, and and since then, um, I kept in in contact with Yabi. He came to visit me when I was a research scientist in in Munich, um, and then. Uh, through a, um, uh, an, another colleague who we had at the time, we also met in South Africa on this houseboat, a guy called Jax. Then um, Jax and I went on and founded this startup company and in which Yabi also works with, in which we've you know, managed to find a lot of talent already from Up10 Academy uh, to, to help us on various data science topics. Um, so yeah, we, we basically have a, a long and quite similar background, I think. The fact that we were both cosmologists um, and of course, cosmology is great in this like data science setting um, because we were already doing data science before data science was even a thing. Um, we were analyzing uh, already back in 2005 when I started my PhD. We had data sets with like 100 million um, entries of different galaxies and hundreds of properties of those galaxies. Some of these properties were 
um, are labeled and, and so some of these galaxies were labeled with things we cared about and some of them were not labeled um, but we wanted to apply labels then of course so we would use algorithms and to, um, to try and apply these labels which then of course machine learning you know is, is a perfect starting point for machine learning algorithms um, but as a, as a data scientist or as a, um, uh, an astrophysicist or a cosmologist um, so we're already used to big data um, we're already used to dealing with algorithms and in fact turning like some mathematical model um, or some theoretical model into an algorithm that can be coded up and then um, uh, applied to data um, and then uh, and, and so that's very similar also to what data scientists do so maybe they'll think of you know how often are people going to come into my store and you might say okay like the end the, the probability of, of, of someone entering my store you could model as like a Poisson uh, as a Poisson distribution uh, and then so you could then turn this uh, theoretical knowledge of Poisson distributions into some mathematical model, which you can then, of course, apply for predicting the likelihood someone will come into a store at some point. Um, and so this is what we were really doing as astrophysicists and cosmologists. And then, yeah, my journey took me... Um, so uh, 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 an academic background is great, but if you want to make the transition into um, uh, uh, from academia into industry, it's really good to have this first um, uh, first footsteps already into industry whilst you're still in, still in academia. And so actually what, what you guys are doing here at the Ten Academy or, or what you all, your students are doing at the Ten Academy is a really great step from transitioning uh, from um, like a, 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 a academic background into a um, uh, in, into an industry back into working in industry um, and it's really these stepping stones which are important to have along the way and they really aid this transition I know many um, researchers who came out of academia look for a job and, and even with PhDs and machine learning experience they found it very tough just to get started um, because industry sees academics as very much a um, uh, uh, a black box they really don't know how to deal with this entity or an unknown entity um, but once once they see on their CV that they've done some projects with companies um, they have some experience then suddenly now they become very employable and so really like the, the type of programs you have where you have um, in 10 Academy where you have people working on projects uh, for companies maybe internships this is super useful because you start putting this on your CV, um, then you immediately become very employable, much more employable than you were if you don't have that on your CV. Um, so yeah, so I, I, I was, um, uh, after my PhD, then I was a postdoc, uh, like Yabi was a postdoc uh, for many years, and the last years of, in both of our research careers, we really started to um, develop um, machine learning algorithms, uh, AI algorithms, if you will, and figure out how we can apply, either make improvements in, in existing algorithms, or how can we apply them to, to data. And so really, maybe taking um, state-of-the-art algorithms and applying them into a domain for us was astrophysics and cosmology that they've never been applied before. Um, and so, uh, okay, so I've mentioned that, uh, and then the, the um, so why, why was it useful to work uh, with a, a startup company uh, when, I, when I first started, um, made, this, made this transition from academia? Um, and it's really because um, academics don't really have the, school, the skill sets that are required for industry. Uh, and one important thing here is actually coding skills. So I know also in 10 Academy that you work hard on coding skills. Um, and this is something that I really learned when I first interacted with developers at, this, at the startup company, which was um, called Adludio, when I was working with these developers, um, is that really, you know, academic co level code skill, skill or coding isn't good enough. You really need to make sure that you're doing things like, um, so wh whatever chosen language, let's use Python as an example, um, that you have like a PEP8 type of a coding standard you, you, you adhere to, um, that you've got some form of documentation, um, that your functions are well, uh, your functions and your variables are, are well named, um, and you have, you know, comments in your code and you, and you describe your functions. And this all sounds uh, obvious, but it's actually only obvious when someone first tells you this. And indeed, you know, no one's born a data scientist and no one's born a coder, but this is something you can just work on and keep improving. 
So I would say if you find if you don't think that you are a great coder, um, just spend some time, read some um, tutorials or follow some tutorials, and really make sure that your coding skills are top notch, um, because this really helps you uh, um, to to make this transition to working with other people in the industry. Um, and the good thing also about um, working uh, in in an actual um, uh, for actual projects is you got, get your hands dirty with data. You see that data never really comes to you in some perfect way. Um, whether you're you know mining insights from log files or dealing with data in databases, um, actually a lot of the effort before you can before you can gain any insights, you have to do a lot of um, pre-processing of the data. So it's either data acquisition or cleaning data that you already have. Um, and for that, like data analysts are a super useful um, uh, sk skill to have and they're super useful uh, to the company. Um, okay, so then I was, uh, yeah, started a, a co-founder of this company, I stayed in academia. And then at some point, a friend of mine, uh, also from academia, um, uh, who that, who had made the transition to industry earlier than I did, um, suggested I apply for a job with Carl Zeiss, uh, and this is where I I, I I moved from academia into, into industry um, full time in 2019. Um, so I've prepared a, a presentation which basically answers some of the questions that you um, uh, that you you wrote um, uh, Yabi and uh, Arun. Um, I should say if I, I'm not checking the the chat for questions, so if they appear, then then just highlight them to me. And so maybe I can share my screen. Um, present a window. Does this work? Exactly. Uh, exactly. So do you see? Uh -huh. Okay, I can see what you can see. Data and problems in Carl Zeiss. Let me click that view. So my computer is actually a bit slow, um, especially when I have video and try and share my video, then things take some time. So I've updated my view, uh, but I see it hasn't yet appeared. Um, we can see your PowerPoint. We can uh, yeah, I changed, the, I changed the view of the PowerPoint, uh, but maybe that didn't actually um, make it into the, uh, okay, can I end the show here? Yeah. Uh -huh. Let me just make this smaller so you can maybe see my screen. Uh, make this bigger somehow. Okay, let's go with that. I think that's fine. Um, okay, so uh, yeah, that's my um, uh, title slide. Um, I thank, first of all, I should say thanks for having um, given me the opportunity to come in and, and meet you all. Um, yeah, as I said, we've worked. I, I came and gave a, a talk last year on um, Bayesian bandits and how they can be applied for different machine learning problems or, or I mean, data science problems. I'm not going to concentrate this time on, on Bayesian bandits, but more talk in general about Carl Zeiss and, and the type of data science that goes on within Carl Zeiss and why, indeed, um, data analysts uh, are useful. Um, so uh, Carl Zeiss uh, is a company that was founded. It's like basically a marriage. Um, in the 19 uh, in the 1800s, between uh, an engineer and a physicist, and the engineer was a guy called Carl Zeiss, and the physicist was a guy called Ernst Abbey, and basically at the time, um, uh, Ernst Abbey was working at a university, um, and he was looking for problems that were tough to solve. Carl Zeiss um, had a problem to solve, but he couldn't solve it, um, and this was how to make a perfect microscope. Or the best microscope, or to make improvements in microscopes. So he went to Ernst Abbey and said, "Hey, I've got this problem. Can you solve it?" And Ernst Abbey, as a physicist, said, "Yeah, I can solve it. Here's a solution." But of course, Ernst didn't have the um, skill set to turn this into a product or to actually build it. And so Carl Zeiss, as an engineer, was able to turn this um, theoretical knowledge into an actual product. And then Carl Zeiss, the company, was born. Um, and since then, there's been a very strong focus between um, this marriage of, of, of science and, and, and research and applying this to a some some business need or, or to some need, so generating something. And for that, and you know, this this interface between engineering and and um, uh, and, and science is is very useful. A lot like the interface now between data scientists and data analysts. 
um, without one, the other can't work. And without knowing what uh, data scientists need to do, data analysts don't know how to prepare data. Um, so the company uh, is, is global. Um, there's about 10,000 employees, uh, 50,000 around the, around the globe and about 10,000 in Germany. Um, and one really nice thing about Carl Zeiss is that we help uh, 10,000 people uh, get their vision back each day through types of, through cataract surgery. Um, and that I mean, that's just one aspect of, of Carl Zeiss, the company. It's, it's grown, it's massive now. We have many different business areas. Um, uh, but this is one nice thing about working for uh, a company like Carl Zeiss. Um, the company is owned by the employees, so it's not like um, uh, there's not some board members or state or or, um, or uh, shareholders you get all the money. Um, money which is generated by Carl Zeiss, the company gets pumped back into the company, um, maybe as in terms of research projects which get funded. And so we have this very strong culture of, of research. Um, and what's nice is because we know that um, uh, scientists are important, uh, then we actually have like a management structure for scientists um, which runs in parallel to the manage management structure we have for, um, uh, for, for project managers um, or for people with um, business backgrounds. And in this management structure, which I'm, I'm, I'm happy to be part of uh, for scientists, um, then you're uh, encouraged to you know, write papers and give talks and visit universities and talk to students and get students um, and really contribute to cutting edge research. Um, and with the idea, of course, that you always have your eye on the next potential application from cutting edge science to what could be applied to today's problems. And so um, Carl Zeiss are famous for making glasses, um, also for um, the um, making uh, planetariums, lenses in, um, in, in uh, mobile phone cameras and lenses in cameras. Um, and indeed, this picture of the, what's called the Earth rise, which is um, a picture from the, from the moon taking as the Earth uh, you know, comes into view, um, was taken with a, a Zeiss uh, camera or a Zeiss lens. Um, OK, so that's everything about Carl Zeiss, uh, about just an overview of the company. And now I'd really like to dive a bit into some of the details of uh, different data science projects that either I've been involved in or, or are happening now in, in Carl Zeiss. And this is really just a subset, a very small subset of, of the projects which are going on um, in the data science type projects which are going on. Um, indeed, the Munich office uh, where, where I'm based is trying to, gr is, is trying to grow drastically um, and uh, and we've got a big hiring spree, so we're really looking for for good people. We also hopefully have internships. I mean, I, I've already tried to work with um, uh, set up internships for um, uh, people from the Ten Academy. I tried to do this last uh, last time. I w I was um, I gave a talk at the Ten Academy. I'm still pushing in this direction. Sadly, um, things have not moved very quickly, but I'm I, I'm still hopeful that, that you know maybe we can get some internships. For, um, for, for some of you, um, um, yeah, contact me if you're interested um, uh, and, and I hope that we can, we can give some good news soon, but I can't guarantee every, anything yet. Okay, so we do lots of predictive maintenance in, in Carl's Ice. Um, and so the idea here is looking at um, log data or temperature data of, of machines or of machines in a production line is try to figure out when a production, when a machine might fail. So of course, to do this, you need um, log data. You also need some label data or knowledge about failures. So when a, a particular product or a particular lens, if you um, in, in this in, a, in an example, um, if a lens is broken and it's been through the production line, um, then you need it to be labeled. Okay, this lens was an issue. There was an issue here, and then you can use this sort of label data and the fact you have lots of information about each of the machines in the um, in the pipeline um, of, of how this lens was generated uh, or, or produced um, to, uh, uh, to, to try and predict then um, in the future, given the various properties of machines, are they likely to fail? And if, and if you can predict this and if it's accurate, then of course you can do some form of predictive maintenance, which will say, um, Okay, I, I predict that this machine will fail in 50 hours. Let's let's just take it down. Uh, let's stop it now. Fix some components that we think will fail, and then start it up again. 
and maybe it's just been switched off for one hour or two hours, um, which could be very different if it's switched off for, you know, um, if it actually breaks and at the, um, uh, and, and then once it's broken, people start figuring out how to fix it. So then you have to order supplies and get those supplies and then, then, and then, in, um, then install them, um, uh, install those new components such that the, the machine will run again. Um, another type of, of um, prediction we, we've been doing, and this is a project I've been involved in, and that's shown in this, in this um, graph uh, or this plot here, is trying to compute when, um, what will be the, um, the computational um, memory requirements of a computing cluster at some time in the future. Um, and let's say we can we know the processes which are happening now. We have some historic data. Well, we have, of course, historic data about um, which computing processes are running, how much memory usage is currently being used. And we can frame the frame this data set as a way of trying to predict what will happen 10 minutes or one hour into the future. And this will, of course, allow us to either um, increase memory of a computing to the computing cluster by adding more nodes or reducing memory if we think, or reducing nodes if we think we're not going to need them. Um, and this basically will allow us to make some form of cost saving. And so what you see is um, the, the algorithms that we trialed, and this was really just basic um, decision tree algorithms. We were using X, um, XGB boost, uh, XDGB, I can't remember now, XGB boost, um, gradient booster trees anyway. Um, and uh, um, one key insight was actually using the current memory um, of the system at, as a, to help us predict this delta uh, or, the, or uh, to what the next memory would be of the system in some future timestamp. And so what you see is we trained our data on some set on, on, on some uh, on some of the data stream, and then for some completely independent set of, of the data stream, maybe from some timestamps we didn't even. The, um, uh, that we didn't even um, use, so some later timestamps that didn't make our training set, then we can test how well would we have predicted the, um, uh, the, the memory usage of the, of the machines. And you see here we've got the predicted mem future memory use in gigabytes on the, um, the x-axis, in, in, which is in terms of thousands, so you know, two terabytes to three and a half terabytes, and the actual memory usage. Um, once we've once we progress ten minutes, we could measure. We could see exactly how much memory did we predict, and how much memory did we um, did, did we actually use, um, and compare the two. And you see, this is a very nice um, uh, um, prediction. We also do lots of image-based uh, deep machine learning. Um, so the idea here is that um, maybe we want to segment a face into the different face components. Um, so we want to know where are the glasses and where are the lenses, um, where's the hair and the beard. Um, and this is an example of what we see uh, in this in the lower right images. Um, and uh, this can help us sort of identify um, who, what type of glasses are you wearing in the image. And then we can maybe make a sale based on finding glasses which are similar. Um, um, also, we can do things like identify the locations of the pupils, and that's shown here by these uh, the little, the very small blue dots in the, in the middle of the eye, of course. Um, and this can help us to make measurements of where the, the pupils are in the image, so we know which part of the glasses the person will look through. Um, and this is actually very important. This is a, a topic called centration. And you have to make the lenses um, in such a way that the person will look through the right part of the lens at the right time when they change that when they move their eyes. So actually, knowing where the pupils are is, is very important. Um, and then we also have some very nice um, augmented reality type um, uh, um, programs uh, where we, in real time, um, will label an image that a um, uh, that an eye surgeon will see. Um, Maybe they'll wear a headset and they'll have like some heads up display and they'll see what they should be operating on, what should they should be cutting and what's normal and what's not. Um, and this is all using uh, augmented reality, um, uh, trained neural networks, of course, uh, but applied to live video feed data rather than um, a static images. Um, we have recommender systems, and this is something that I was actually brought into, into Zeiss to work on. I was asked to build a glasses recommender system. So the idea is someone walks into a store, 
um, uh, into an optician's store and we and they don't know what glasses to buy um, maybe there's like 10,000 pairs of glasses and then they don't know which is the best pair of glasses so we'll take a picture of their face send that to our, to our service and then we will recommend which are the best frames or best glasses that, will, that, that that consumer is most likely to buy um, uh, and we have the t other types of recommender systems um, so you can imagine that um, uh, uh, a, a particular customer might have some data products pr products of ours um, uh, running on their machine, uh, but not, not other data products, and maybe want to try and do some upselling to figure out what data products we should sell them so they can have on their machines, uh, and, and so that they can, um, you know, to, to improve their workflows or quality of life, but of course to make money for, um, for Zeiss at the end of the day. <clears throat> Uh, and then something that I've been involved in a lot more recently is really, uh, it's sort of like a general application of machine learning um, to do what, you know, all, almost all machine learning is really just function approximation. And you can choose what that function is. And that function can be a human uh, that you try to approximate. So imagine you have some task. Um, and this task is a repeated task. So someone's filling in a web page, for example, or maybe someone is um, uh, scanning a 3D frame or, or um, uh, really just some repeated task that a human is doing. And now if you have some um, initial state, some input to this task, um, and, have, and, if you, and then the human works with those inputs, and then if you have some final state, uh, some outputs um, that the human has produced, um, then you're really starting to think, and if you repeat this a lot, and each time you store what the inputs were, you store what the outputs were, um, and then you're really building up a data set that you can actually use for some type of um, uh, function approximation or human approximator, and of course some deep machine learning or, or AI algorithms are great for this. Um, so what I've really been working on and thinking about recently is how can we automate tasks which humans do uh, regularly for which we can store both the inputs and outputs then at some point we can replace the human or some parts of the, the task the human does with some algorithm um, and this of course leads to um, freeing up the human to do more interesting tasks I mean humans get bored very quickly and so repetitive tasks are not you know um, uh, and maybe not the best design for, for humans to do um, <coughs> Can make this very fast so it can actually save the human lots of time and from a business perspective maybe it's great to um, replace the human um, and maybe you can even save uh, save cash so imagine you um, send this task out to some external partner to do um, if you can use an algorithm to do this instead of this external partner then you can have some cost savings and the bottom line is that maybe um, some of these tasks are too difficult to um, like to, to completely automate uh, with an algorithm. Um, but even if you can just automate some of the task and you can make the human's life easier, then you still have a win. Um, so even if, um, if so that I think this, this idea of trying to automate human tasks is something that it will become a lot bigger in, in, in Zeiss, but also around the world and is, is even, you know, becoming a lot bigger and um, uh, uh, being, um, there's a lot more work in this direction now um, because really we, we want to be minimizing, you know, this repeated task that humans do because that's um, that does, if you can replace it with an algorithm, then you can make massive cost savings. So that's an overview of the types of projects that are going on at Carl Zeiss. Um, I've seen there's been, uh, so, so the next uh, slide is really um, answering in a bit more detail some of the other points that, um, uh, that the, uh, the questions that were asked of me uh, to, when I prepared this talk, but maybe I can come to the chat to see if there are people, um, if there are questions which uh, have been asked that I should answer. Uh, uh, where, where compute? Okay, when working at a large multinational, where computing power or cost is not likely to be a major problem and when you have decades of, of data, what are the key challenges that the company faces in improving data science results? Uh, the answer to that is clear, and that is access, accessing the data, getting the data in the format that you need it. 
Um, it, already at Carl Zeiss, um, we've we're relatively early on in our on our in our transition to be re a really data driven company. Um, and what you find is that it, this is the same at almost all companies. Any company that's older than like five or ten years, you, you'll find this problem. Is that data often sits in different silos, and it was never data was never really generated with the idea of mining that data for value. And so, first of all, identifying the identifying the data streams, um, identifying where those data, you know, who owns those data streams, where they sit, how to access them, and whether that data stream is good enough to be used in some project. And what needs to be done with that data stream in terms of data preparation or cleaning, and then figuring out how to take this data stream and map it uh, or and merge it together with this data stream. Um, that's that's the biggest challenges, and I think all multinational companies have this issue. Some are more um, further along the um, uh, um, along the road of fixing this problem than others. Um, but yeah, I mean, if you've got a very big company, then um, that, that's older than five or ten years, then you definitely will find this problem somewhere. Um, so the key challenges is getting the data in the right format. Um, to what extent is the business side of Carl Zeiss business knowledgeable about what data science can do and cannot realistically deliver? Deliver. Very nice question. Um, so at Carl Zeiss, we have a research and technology branch, and they actually do cutting edge research uh, in different ML techniques, uh, ML algorithms, data science. Um, and so the idea is to try and bring the knowledge from these people and apply it into some business needs or to have this sharing uh, between um, business and uh, and science. And really, the, you know, how Carl Zeiss was started with this, with this sharing of knowledge or expertise from science and engineering. So of course the sharing of of what's what's feasible from um, from a science perspective or data science perspective, sharing this with with our, our business leaders, um, is something that we um, we try to do. Um, of course it's difficult because the lexicon we have is, is different, and so uh, finding a joint lexicon is a great uh, starting point. And for that you have like workshops where you get together with business leaders and and, and uh, tech leaders get together and and, and and exchange ideas and try to come up with some common glossary. Um, um, but it's really the point of the of the scientists in Carl Zeiss to really identify if the business leaders or, or for the people from business side, if they think if if they have unrealistic expectations of what AI can do. Um, and so, you know, part of the job of, of being a data scientist is to also or also say to people, um, you know, th this is a nice idea, but uh, um, that's a 50 year project and not a 10 month project. And of course, people want results or typically people want a turnaround time of six months or a year. Um, <clears throat> and so it's part of our job to also tell people what's what's realistic. Um, uh, how do you confidently report results of predictive models when you do not actually know if the future will be the same as the past or if the model you are using is the best? Good question. Um, so I always, um, anytime I do prediction, then I always cut my time. The, the, I have, uh, let's say I have, I have data across some length of time. I always make a hard cut in um, uh, in time. And so let's say the last six months of data, I will never touch. Um, in the, in the, and then the previous data for so that last six months, now I train algorithms and I tune them and I try and make sure that they're performing perfectly here. And once I'm happy with the algorithm and how it runs, now I will, then, then I stop algorithm development. I will then apply that to the remaining uh, future time, which I, I, I cut out before this first six months, and I will report results based on this, um, on the latest six months, for example. Now, this doesn't mean that the uh, you can't have an algorithm that sort of self-learns during that time based on this continuous uh, data stream. As, as, as you go through this last six months, you can put data in and it can update but figuring out what's the right self-learning model, you you really do just on the earlier phase, in the earlier phase, and, and at the 
um, on the earlier data stamp, on the earlier data times. Um, so now I've got a model which I think I can trust, um, but you're exactly right. The future never looks like the past, um, or very rarely looks like the past. And so you always have to warn people, right? Saying, look, this is the best that I can possibly do. Um, this is what we think will happen, but um, uh, this is a prediction. Um, if predicting the future were easy, um, I wouldn't be working for Carl Zeiss. I would be sat on an I, I would I would own my own island, something the size of Africa, and I would be drinking cocktails uh, and having parties every day. Um, so you know, predicting the future is of course tough, and you just have to um, tell people, make it realistic. So not only do you have to say what are the um, what types of algorithms are possible in, a, in, in, in machine learning and how you can apply them to business, but as part of our jobs is also to tell business leaders um, or, or managers when, how much you should believe these algorithms. Um, and you know, we can, uh, we, we can come up with, these, with some metrics, but at the end of the day, you always have to say, we're predicting the future. Predicting the future is tough. Um, Now this can be fine, right? Um, if uh, if you just wanted to predict what sales tomorrow and, uh, and or what sales in six months, and you've got lots of data, sure you can predict sales. And if you get it right, it's fine. If you're wrong, also fine. It's not optimal, but it's fine. If you're predicting, you know, is someone going to live or die in two months based on the information you have? Then you need to be very careful. So then, then basically, um, it would be our job to put the brakes on and say, look. This is a really tough problem, and it, and it has massive impact to someone's life. Um, so we need to think very carefully, do we want to even make this prediction? And I also see part of this is, is our role as, uh, as, as data scientists or people from an academic background to really, um, uh, really control what it's like managing the expectations. It's man expectation management, managing the expectations of the people who who we're selling our results to. How much data do the company generate per day? Where is it stored, and how is it accessed by an individual team? These are great questions. Um, if I had the answers to these, I could actually already start on am amazing data science projects with Insights. Um, we're not there yet, uh, so I can't actually answer this question. I can tell you we generate a lot of data. Um, it's stored all over the show. Um, uh, it's, it's stored in the cloud. It's stored in devices in factories. It's stored in on people's desktops. It's stored on iPhones. Or uh, how is it accessed by an individual team? Um, often with great difficulty. Uh, it depends on the type of data we're talking about. We have medical data, which means it's very difficult to access. And we have, you know, um, less in. Or we have we have business data, which maybe is very difficult to access because we don't want our business data forecast for sales or or revenue getting into the wrong hands. Um, and then we have maybe less interesting data, like um, you know, um, potentially, uh, um, or let's say it's data which is not so um, critical and that maybe it's a bit easier to access. But the bottom line is that that's. Um, uh, not it's not easy to answer the uh, uh, to get you know this is something that we as a company are embarking on identifying our data streams where they sit and how to access them right now um, we've, we've made good steps but we're, we're not there yet how do you choose the best algorithm um, I always like to start off keeping it simple so I try to use a very simple algorithm um, imagine a linear regression or some type of a, um, um, a decision tree based algorithm. Um, I'd always try that before I move to something um, more complex like a, a deep neural network. Um, of course, it depends on the on the problem. If you're just dealing with um, tabular data, then uh, some uh, simple decision tree could work very well or random forest. If you're or already dealing with image data, then you're really forced to go uh, down the road of um, deep machine learning and, and um, uh, from from the get-go. Um, I think the question is, is what is the, how important is the prediction and what's the thing that you're really trying to predict? Like, 
when you look at uh, Kaggle contests or, or um, machine learning um, uh, uh, tutorials, they'll tell you about the ROC, you know, the area under the curve. They'll tell you about precision, uh, um, uh, recall rate, F1 score, et cetera. Um, I, actually, I don't care about any of those metrics. Um, I care about uh, the, the metric which is important to the business unit. And so um, imagine you're making a recommendation for, for glasses, um, and you might have a great ROC score, but um, uh, when you actually come to apply this algorithm in the field, um, the consumers don't like your recommendations. And then for me, this uh, people not liking your recommendations in as, as this setting is running in the wild is more important than you know what the how the model was performing when you when you were testing it locally. I don't think this is a, a very good example because you know this is already one of the metrics would be like F1 score or something. Um, so let me try and think of another example uh, where I try and um, really describe what I mean. Um, so if you have um, Okay, so I'm, I'm working on a project where we're exactly trying to, um, I won't go into the details, but we're, we're trying to replace a human using some AI algorithm. And what we have is we have some inputs, um, we have some different choices of algorithms which could replace that human, we have some outputs. Now once we have those outputs, then we actually go to subsequent, we take those outputs and we go to subsequent next steps. Um, and so the next step would be taking this output and showing it to business people and are they happy with it, showing it to consumers, are you happy with it, um, and, and, uh, and getting their feedback. Maybe you build a web page with it, or you basically, I, I'm sorry for being so generic, but you basically take something with the output. But that, like how good or bad your ROC score or your, um, your, uh, um, your, your F1 score was, um, when you're choosing the algorithm, isn't really the important part. What's important is when you've taken that output, how is that used subsequently? How is that used later on? And that for me is the most important metric. Um, but that's not something that's easy to measure. It's sort of like having a reinforcement learning problem where you take some actions you take, train a model, test the model, um, lead to some outputs. And then those outputs are used somewhere else. So the next step in your reinforce in, in your exploration through through your space, and that leads to some result. And so it's sort of much more like a a reinforcement learning problem in the fact that you take actions, and then those actions lead to more actions. And at some point in the future, um, you might have some very fuzzy cost function, um, but it's not so. But, but that actually doesn't help you train your uh, machine learning algorithm when you just have your inputs and outputs. Um, so it's a long, a long uh, answer. I mean, what I in practice, what I would do was try to get the best score, ROC score, whatever. It doesn't really matter which one, but then see how that is used, and then choose between different models based on um, these subsequent steps which are taken. Um, I believe there have been a lot of, next question, I believe there have been a lot of failed attempts in data science projects. How are these in, uh, in, uh, incidences handled and when do you completely write off a project? That's, so the statement is very true. Um, there are many ML projects which fail and how do you, um, uh, hand, how do you handle these incidences and, and, how, and when do you completely write off a project? Um, uh, so I think this comes from um, how much appetite is there from a business direction to keep funding the, 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 the project. Um, if the business appetite is there, so even if you're working on something that's maybe not so useful, the results are crap, are not so good, um, but there's still massive business interest in you to work on that, then they'll keep funding it, then you can keep going. Um, if you if if business interest dies and the project um, doesn't look very good, then you stop. Um, um, how are these incidences handled? Uh, typically, the people working on these projects will just be redistributed within other teams working on other projects. 
Um, that's 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 what we do within SICE. Um, it's very unlikely. So if you get a job with a company and some uh, one project fails, it's very unlikely you'll get um, fired because of that. Because for data analysts and data scientists, there's so many projects that one could work on within a company. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. There were a couple of questions, Ben, that uh, were before it. So the one by Kevin have. is, you mentioned continuous training that the data comes in. Which other ways do you I track have. model degradation or model already in production? Yep. Um, nice. Thanks. Um, so you mentioned continuous training as the data comes in. What other ways do you tackle model degradation for a model already in production? And so we do have um, some form of ML ops in operation. And so the idea here is, of course, that you constantly checking your incoming data to see if it looks like your training data. And when it starts to deviate from your training data, then then you maybe need to re um, make sure that the um, uh, the results are the predictions are, are still good. And if they're not anymore, then you need to, of course, update your um, uh, model based on this data drift that you're seeing. Um, nice ways of doing this, of course, are having some forgetfulness in your model. Um, you could think of this even um, you could have like a, a random forest can also be like a, a model which forgets. Imagine you train it on some data and um, new data comes in. You keep training on the new data and you just prune some of the decision trees that you had in your model um, or in terms of like weight decay in terms of uh, for neural networks. So you can keep keep updating it. Um, uh, uh, and. Um, so yeah, so so I mean, there are there are ways. So basically, identifying your um, predictions. You first of all identifying your data looks different from your training data. That's the that's the most important thing, and then trying to identify if your recommend or if your predictions now no longer um, have good accuracy. Um, that might be difficult because if you're applying a a, a product in the field, um, then you might not have access to the uh, feedback is this is this prediction correct or not? Um, depends a bit on on the business setting um, or or what where you have, whether or not you have access to this. But the first thing to look at is always does the data look the same? Uh, and if it does, then you can you have some some level of trust in your data. But not always, of course. Is there a deployed system that is uh, currently automated repeated ta repeated task at Carl Zeiss? Uh, yes, there is. Um, I'm working on this. Um, I don't think I can go into so many details. Apologies. Um, I'm dealing with 3D data and 3D data modeling, um, and um, uh, but I, I, I can't go into uh, any, any more details. I apologize. Um, probably, I could, given some time, I could think of another um, automated repeated task project. Oh, yes, I, I can talk about another one, sure. So another project that I'm working on um, basically tries to automate um, the searching of um, Google or, or Bing. Um, and so imagine that you want to find uh, new customers. Well, then you could go to um, a, you could maybe have a, a long list of, of websites um, that you think might, might be a new potential customer. You can go to each website and you can click through each website and uh, you can figure out is that is that company likely to be a potential customer? Um, of course, that's very human intensive. And imagine you have a list of 30,000 websites and you want to identify potential customers. So I built a web service which basically uses um, a web search. Um, uh, uh, it's interface to a Google search or a Bing search, which um, allows you to look for particular keywords uh, or synonyms of those keywords on a, on a particular domain. On a web domain, and so it's and it's automated. So you upload thirty thousand websites, upload sets of keywords, and you automatically are generated with a, a report which tells you which of those websites score very highly in in a Google rank for the keywords that you care about. Um, and that basically would give you some indication. Okay, rather than looking through these thirty thousand websites, I'll concentrate on those five hundred websites. Um, and maybe we also provide links to which pages are, high, are highly ranked, so they already had a, have a good starting point. Um, so that's a one one example of, of some process automation that, that I've implemented. Uh, we're working at Zeiss, and and uh, leads to massive time savings and keeps people sane. Like 
going through a, a thousand websites would drive anybody well drive me insane i'm sure uh i think those are all the topics um i see we're yeah. out of time um so maybe let me briefly go through um the last points some key sources of data um i always like to try and think outside my box so whenever you start a machine learning project often you don't have the data that you need um but you can actually if you think a bit about the problem you can get data from somewhere so try C kaggle maybe kaggle's got similar data already that you can just download and access um or try i mean i like to scrape uh, google a lot uh, for for content um maybe you can have some uh, have some interface to a search engine um to scrape the data that you need so you can already get started on the project um and if uh and again i would never start with a a from scratch with a uh, a deep learning model or, or some machine learning model um i would always just first go to uh this this website oh, you don't see my screen i oh, do my see my screen um this model zoo just go there um maybe there's already a trained model that does exactly the task you want you just need to download it uh run it in some environment and 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 you're done um so i i would always look for existing data first um then of course you need to start thinking about how to get your own data um <clears throat> um mass of data can be obtained from log files and from passing log files um, and this is really a job of a data analyst to to massage data sets in a way that they can then be used in the next steps for a data scientist. Um, what are the future directions that we have in, 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 the, in the data ecosphere at ZEISS? Um, I've been in charge of organizing uh, internal data hackathons. So the idea is to bring business owners who have a data stream with data scientists who can and data analysts who can mine that stream for value um, and by doing so, we start a, a common dialogue between these different people and of different roles. Um, and this really helps us to blur the boundary between a data scientist, a data analyst, a database engineer, a cloud uh, uh, engineer, um, a machine learning ops um, uh, um, a, a, um, a scientist, and uh, you know, a product owner or a product manager or some um, business uh, business owner. Um, and by blurring the boundaries between these different job roles, it really helps the end-to-end -end, um, pipeline. Um, uh, so it, it makes future uh, projects easier to work on. So if a um, someone, a, if a developer knows how an analyst is going to take their log files and and turn that into a product to store in a database, they can already think about how they should be writing their log files, what error messages they should occur, how can they format it. If the data analyst knows what data uh, what database engineer is going to be doing, then they can figure out how to take that log file data, put it into a format that you can just insert into a database. Likewise, if uh, a database engineer knows what a data scientist is going to do, then they can prepare the database so it's in the right format, so a data scientist can um, uh, um, uh, extract it and mine value. And if the data scientist knows what the business leader is interested in, then they can figure out what are the right questions to be asking of the data that would bring the most business value, and they can provide input to the data uh, to the business owner to suggest what they could measure um, that could bring business value. Um, and so I see actually that this data hackathon is a way of um, this internal Zeiss data hackathon as a way of of bringing this data ecosystem um, within Zeiss uh, to the next uh, next level. Are there any major challenges? Uh, um, challenging the, uh, any major challenges? Uh, challenges for the business? Um, is able to solve? Uh, comma the business is able to solve using data. The answer is yes, many of them. But the the zeroth problem is getting the data. Um, as I mentioned before, um, collecting the data, creating it, finding who owns the data, joining the data, and then we can start mining it for business value. Uh, and exactly in this role, then you know, as I've said all along. Uh, in, in this presentation, data analyst, analysts uh, and data scientists are super useful. And indeed, once you've got a correct, I, I think many companies are now finding this, that when you, once you have a critical mass of data scientists, two or three, depending on the project you need, adding more data scientists doesn't really bring you very far. You really need to be bringing in support structures for these people. So bring in data analysts. Um, and indeed, 
probably without a data analyst, a data scientist can't go very far. Um, but definitely as the data science team grows, you need data analysts uh, supporting them. Uh, and I think that brings me to end of all the all the questions that I was asked. So I will stop sharing my screen. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Ben. Uh, there are just one question, two questions, but I'm not sure the second one, but you can just look at it. So how's the work culture for fresh data science engineers um, like us and want to join your company? If you want to say a few words on that, like we have three minutes. Another one is more technical, which is more like um, you can read it OpenCV on JavaScript versus Python. Uh, right, yeah. Uh, so the second one I would use um, Whatever is most popular. So go to um, unless you have a particular company in mind, or there's some data, uh, some models which only have been trained, which nowadays really doesn't exist um, in one language. I would just use the most popular language. That's uh, Python and Keras or, or Py PyTorch. Um, and then, of course, if you're doing stuff in the browser, um, then then JavaScript is the right way to go. Um, how is your work culture for fresh data science engineers like us and want to join your company? Um, so we have, um, um, so we're expanding pretty quickly uh, and we currently we want, uh, most of the hires are within Germany and we're a bit scared of hiring people outside of Germany. And so unless you have some way to get to Germany, um, hiring, uh, um, uh, people from the Ten Academy directly into Zeiss full time will be, is challenging. Um, this is something I'm trying to work on with with some people in Zeiss, um, and and like doing these type of internships will be the first step, the first way to do, first way to go um, down this road. Um, we're not there yet, but I'm I'm hoping we can have some. You know, I'm hoping something in the next couple of months. Um, how is your work culture for fresh data scientists? Um, so basically, we hire data scientists. Um, uh, and and the the team we're growing is really very new, and so I, I can't answer this exactly. But we already have projects for the the data scientists to be working on, and through these type of hack sessions we're having, um, and other other information streams we have in Zeiss, we we, we are growing the number of projects that we we want data scientists to work on. Um, we have a support network because we've got many advanced uh, or, or senior data scientists, maybe like myself. Um, we have this research community, which can also help out with um, data scientists and, and give them ideas and keep them up to date with the latest techniques. Um, so there's quite a bit of um, uh, quite an ecosystem for looking after um, new data scientists. Um, and data engineers, a uh, critical part of the job. Um, data data analysts, critical part of the job. Um, and um, we're now building up um, uh, these teams also within Zeiss. Great. Thank you so much, Ben. I think this has been really exciting and a number of great questions as well. Um, so thank you so much. So um, I think, yeah, let's finish it here. If you have, yeah. if you want to say anything, just no. last word. Okay, okay. I'll just say thanks a lot. Um, and if you want to reach out to me, um, find me on LinkedIn. Um, I guess you can just find my name, Ben Hoyle, or yeah. something. I'm on LinkedIn, I'm in Munich. Um, yeah. Uh, you're welcome to ask any questions. Um, uh, good luck. Um, you know, we I know that the Ten Academy produces really great students uh, and really people fit for work. And and I hope you all um, uh, find nice jobs, um, nice internships and jobs. Thanks. Thanks, Ben. Okay. Really Thanks, Yabi. Yeah. Cheers. Cheers, everyone. Bye, everyone.